Tonight, I'm going to point my telescope some 25 million light years away to try and photograph a spiral galaxy called M106. It's home to one of the most mysterious phenomena in the universe. Two massive jets of hydrogen gas coming out of the center of the galaxy. We don't know exactly what's causing this, but it has something to do with the fact that M106 is an active galaxy. It has an extremely bright core, with more light and energy than what can be accounted for by its stars alone. The difference is caused by a supermassive black hole, which is eating up material at the galaxy's center. In this video, I'm going to attempt to photograph this galaxy using my mid-1980s Celestron telescope and mount. It's going to be my most difficult project yet, but if it works, if I can pick up on those jets of hydrogen, I'll be able to say that my vintage telescope has successfully detected the presence of a black hole. Astrophotography would be easy if the night sky was frozen in place, but because we live on a spinning planet, the stars constantly drift throughout the night, which is why most astrophotography setups look something like this, which is what I typically use for taking pictures of space. It has my small refractor telescope called the Red Cat 51, an astronomy camera, and probably the most important piece, a computerized mount. Once it's properly aligned, it can follow the stars, holding them in place so I can take long exposures of faint nebulas and galaxies. It even has what's called go-to technology, meaning that it can point the telescope at any object in the night sky with the push of a button. It even has an auto-guiding system, which is a smaller camera and telescope that keeps an eye on the stars and corrects the mount if it starts to drift even a little bit off course, keeping my images nice and sharp. Really, the technology available to us amateur astronomers today is incredible. This setup does have one weakness, however, which is the fact that it's a small telescope. It's perfect for imaging the larger targets in the night sky, like lots of nebulas in our Milky Way that take up big sections of the sky. But it's not great at photographing other galaxies. Really, there's only a handful of them that are close enough to us here in the Milky Way to be big enough for this telescope like the Andromeda Galaxy, or the Triangulum. Beyond those, once you move out to more distant galaxies, they're just too far away. They appear too small to be resolved in detail by this telescope. There's simply no way that I can get a good image of M106 using this telescope, especially if I want to reveal those massive jets of hydrogen gas. Which brings us to my other telescope, my vintage 1980s Celestron C8. The way it's set up is perfect for imaging this galaxy. It's about five times more zoomed in than my other telescope. This will be a big challenge because the telescope is still attached to its original mount from the 1980s. Once plugged in, it does track the motion of the stars, but taking long exposures with it is no easy task. Celestron still makes these telescopes and they're still popular for astrophotography today, but most people put them on modern computerized mounts. You might be wondering, why don't I take this telescope and put it on my other mount? That's just not possible. First of all, that mount is just too small to handle a telescope this big. And second, the Celestron telescope is pretty firmly attached to its original 1980s mount. Photographing this galaxy this way, using the original vintage mount, is going to be one of the most difficult shots I've ever taken. A big reason for that is that this is a heavier telescope, meaning it's harder on the mount, to keep it on track. It's also more zoomed in, which means that the mount has to track even more precisely because the stars are moving faster. A good analogy for this is how if you're standing on the side of the road, cars that go by appear to be faster than if you're watching it from a distance. The same thing applies here. Any small errors in the mount's tracking will be even more pronounced. And if the stars drift even a little bit during the exposure, then your picture will be blurry. This means that I'll have to keep my exposures shorter than normal. Typically when imaging galaxies, you leave the shutter open for several minutes at a time. This vintage mount is just not capable of holding the stars exactly in place for that long. I'm thinking around 10 seconds long will be a good fit. Any longer than that, and I'll start to run into problems. In astrophotography, the total imaging time is what matters. So in theory, a single one minute exposure is equal to say, six 10 second long exposures. The goal here is to keep the exposures short enough for this mount to handle and for the images to remain sharp, and just to take lots of them, several hours worth. By doing this, I think it's possible to match the resolution we would get if we put this telescope on a modern computerized mount. And hopefully we can transform this vintage system into a super sharp astrophotography telescope. 
this scope has a big mirror and a lot of power. So if it works, the results, the detail we can get in this galaxy could be incredible. There are four steps we need to follow to photograph this galaxy, and each one will be made much more difficult by using this vintage equipment. First step is polar alignment. Pointing the mount exactly at the North Celestial Pole, so it'll follow the stars accurately. Next up, we'll be getting everything in focus, followed by locating the galaxy. Only after doing all of that will I be ready to finally start taking pictures. Right from the very first step, I discover a big problem. So I'm trying to figure out how to polar align this telescope, and there's definitely a big problem. The way polar alignment works is actually pretty simple. You set the angle of the mount according to your latitude on the Earth. Then when you point your scope straight out from it, you're pointing right at the North Star, which is right next to the Celestial North Pole. Then using your camera connected to a computer, you take a picture, rotate the telescope, and take another picture. If you're properly polar aligned, the Celestial Pole will be in the middle of the image and all the stars will rotate in a circle around it. If not, then you're not properly aligned. Then you can adjust the position of the mount, left or right or up or down, using the knobs on the mount. And once I'm properly aligned, then the mount will be ready to track the stars. The problem is, I can't point this telescope at the celestial pole because the camera is too long. It sticks out too far and actually bump into the base of the telescope. Fortunately, this galaxy is in another part of the sky, so it won't stop us from imaging the galaxy itself. But it doesn't solve the problem of how do we get polar aligned if we can't point our telescope where it needs to be to do that. The solution I've come up with is to use my guide scope and guide camera for my other setup. You might remember that this takes a look at the stars and corrects the mount if it starts to go off course. This vintage setup doesn't have that capability, so we're only using this to get polar aligned. You can do polar alignment with any camera and scope combination. It doesn't have to be the one you take your final picture with. This will work because I've attached it to the side where the finder scope is if you're using this telescope visually, which means I can begin the night with the main camera not attached, which will allow me to point the telescope at the celestial pool, and I'll use this smaller setup to get polar aligned. Once that's complete, the guide scope and guide camera will have served its purpose, so I'll unplug it, point the telescope towards this galaxy, and attach the main imaging camera. That should solve this problem. And now all we have to do is wait for a dark and clear night. A few days later, clear skies move into the area. After bringing everything outside and getting it set up, it's time for polar alignment. My improvised setup works. With the help of my computer, I'm able to achieve a really good polar alignment after a couple minutes of making adjustments to the mount. Then I point the telescope away from the celestial pole so I can attach my camera. I spend a few minutes carefully getting the image in focus. Then it's time to find the galaxy. Remember that I have to do this manually. My computer helps me out here. As I move the telescope around, it looks through my camera and tells me exactly when the galaxy is in frame. After some trial and error, I discover that 8 seconds long is a good exposure time. And incredibly, even though it's more than 40 years old, this vintage mount is still tracking the stars very precisely. I'm taking 8 second exposures, so you're not going to see a lot just in this single 8 second shot, but already I can see the core of this galaxy. This is always my favorite part of the night, when you get those first images coming back in. And I love trying to wrap my head around the fact that we're photographing a galaxy that's tens of millions of light years away. We're collecting light that left this galaxy some 25 million years ago, has traveled all the way to the Milky Way through my telescope and onto my camera sensor. And to be doing it with a telescope from the 1980s on its original vintage mount really feels incredible. Now I just need to take as many photos as I can. I'll spend the rest of the night imaging this galaxy. In total, I captured more than 1,600 eight second exposures of this galaxy. In addition to what you saw, I actually set up on another night to capture more data. And there were two other nights where I set everything up just for clouds to roll in right as it got dark. So this was quite the effort. It adds up to three and a half hours of total imaging time. It took my computer over eight hours to combine all of these individual exposures into this final picture of Spiral Galaxy M106. I think
think this is a fantastic image given the equipment and limitations that I had. This really is a beautiful spiral galaxy. You can see how incredibly bright the center or the core of it is. It has a really cool spiral structure. No matter how often I photograph galaxies, each time it blows my mind that we're looking at the glow from billions of stars put together. We're looking at the dust and gas around those stars at such a grand scale that they form these spiral structures. You might notice these small pink spots in the galaxy. These are regions of active star formation. They're nebulas, much like the ones in our own galaxy and in our own night sky, like Orion, for example. But these are nebulas inside of this galaxy. It's incredible that we can see it from all the way over here in the Milky Way, some 25 million light years away. Now the question is, was I able to pick up on those massive jets of hydrogen gas coming out of the galaxy as a result of that supermassive black hole in the center? And no, I wasn't able to pick it up. I knew it would be a really big challenge to do this with such short exposures. You probably also need a specialized filter designed just to collect light emitted from hydrogen gas, or I need to take significantly more exposures. Given that it took my computer some eight hours to process three and a half hours worth of images, you can imagine if I doubled or tripled the amount of photos I took, it would take my computer days on end just to stack them. That gets really impractical really quickly. Even though I wasn't able to pick up on those jets of hydrogen gas, I think this is still a really good image of this galaxy. I think it holds up well against other images of M106 taken by photographers today, especially those taken on more modern computerized mounts. And it makes sense why people buy these types of mounts. I have one for my smaller setup. With all of this modern technology, it makes everything so much easier. I can even set that mount to image all night and wake up to hours of data to work with. I had none of those luxuries using this vintage mount. I was constantly going outside every few minutes to check on it or to put the galaxy back in the center of the frame. So it makes sense that nobody is doing galaxy photography using vintage equipment like this anymore. But I think it puts me in some uncharted territory. I think this is probably one of the sharpest and most detailed galaxy photos ever taken on this vintage 1980s Celestron mount. And that's pretty cool to be able to say. I think that says something about thinking outside the box and using the equipment that you have available, even if it isn't perfect for the job. I'm really happy with how this picture turned out and what I was able to do with this vintage equipment. If you don't have the most modern expensive equipment, that's okay. You can still take great photos of the night sky. And if you have one of these vintage Celestron telescopes sitting around like mine, take it outside under the stars you might be surprised at what you're able to do. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, clear skies.